It was the fall of 2002, and the first time I heard him speak, I knew there was something very unique about Roy Soup Campbell. As we sat on his front porch at 5 o'clock in the morning a month later, Soup told me that he wasn't interested in how smart or talented I was, but that if I was faithful, he could show me how to be a man of God. I never had a man challenge me like that. I quickly accepted, and my life would never be the same as Soup began discipling me that day. Hi, and welcome to Mid-South Viewpoint. I'm Byron Tyler, and today we welcome Roy Soup Campbell and Ken and Vaughn to our program. Gentlemen, hi, and welcome. Glad to be here today. Thanks so much. Kenan, I feel like we're making history today because for the longest time, I have been trying to lasso this guy to your left to get him in the studio, and uh, he is traveling all over the world, uh, part of the ministry of making disciples. Mm -hmm. You uh, called a vision because the time you spent with Soup for creating a ministry called Downline Ministries uh, based on discipleship. And uh, so I, I'm really excited to get you two guys in the same room and talk about, you know, downline, talk about discipleship. Yeah, I am too. I, it's not easy to get soup on lockdown. He's a, he's a globetrotter for the Lord. And um, like you, Byron, I, uh, I love to just be with him, to hear him uh, continue to share his uh, wisdom on making disciples. He's made a lifetime out of that. And uh, just being around him, I always glean so much, uh, both from his example, from his experiences that are shared. And so I'm really excited about our time today. I'm, I'm just excited to be here. So do you remember that first time you met Ken and Vaughn? I do. The first time I met him was uh, at a church service, and he was uh, contemplating on going to play with Athletes in Action. And uh, his mother, his sweet mother, Miss Peachy, asked uh, if, if, he, I sh he, if she should let him go. And I had played with Athletes in Action in the early days, back in the early 80s, and I said, sure, let him go. It'll, it'll make a man out of him, is what I told him. <laughs> and, uh, and he did. And the next time I met him, though, was at that youth group. Uh, he invited me to come and share and speak. Mm -hmm. What was it about uh, Kenan, maybe uh, qualities, characteristics, or something that stood out to, to you when you first met him? Well, when I first met him, I just knew he was kind of a bright-eyed young man, bunch of zeal. And I had seen that in a lot of young men who would say, hey, I want to spend time with you, get with you. But then a week later, after we said these are the requirements, this is the standard, you didn't see him anymore. So I wanted to make sure that this young man was really about what he uh, said he wanted to do and if he was going to be faithful to this process. Yeah, Ken, and I remember the story. You mm -hmm. told me there was quite a few obstacles that uh, Soup put in your way. He would tell you, you know, meet me here or there, and then cancel on you last minute. And you really didn't see how hungry you were to yeah. show up. Yeah, I don't know that he ever canceled anything on me, but he, he, uh, yeah, he, he. Uh, the first time I called him, he, he told me he just had a lot going on to give him about a week and call again, and and so I did. And and that when I called then, he told me to call him in a month. And and there was a period of time in there I just thought maybe he was blowing me off. And and I don't know. I still to this day I don't know exactly what Soup was thinking during that time. But. Uh, but I'm glad I called him a month later, and that's when he invited me out to his home uh, in the, the wee hours of the morning. And uh, I'm just, to this day, forever grateful that I got out of bed that day and went, and uh, it was the beginning of me seeing what it meant to follow Jesus Christ. And what was it that you saw? What was mm -hmm. it that stood out to you, Kenan? Well, I think when he said the, the, the phrase that you read, when he said, uh, I don't care how smart or talented you are, all I care about is whether or not you can be faithful. And, of course, I didn't understand exactly what that meant. But he said, I'll show you how to be a man of God. And, and what stuck out that morning, what made my heart beat fast, was that there was someone, and Soup used the word standard a moment ago, there was someone who was willing to, uh, to be a visible standard for me of how to follow Christ and inviting me along. And, and frankly, Byron, and I'm not pointing a finger here at anybody else, but I just never received that kind of an invitation, that kind of a challenge, kind of the same one Jesus gave the 12, y'all follow me. I just had never had a godly man looking me in the eyes saying, I know the way and you can come. And it just, just lit me. So what does it take for somebody to make a challenge or call someone to challenge that, that, that following like that? I mean, uh, I have to be honest with you, I've never been personally challenged in those words myself, you know, on an individual one-on-one -on -one basis. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, I've been an athlete all my life, and when you're an athlete, you're called up to challenges to play sports, and you're challenged to run and, and uh, really discipline yourself. But it seems like when it comes to Christianity, we, we, we're afraid to make that challenge, especially to the men, and afraid that they will back away, they'll pull away. But if you look at uh, 
the Marines or the special forces or groups like that, they make those special challenges to men, and they have a line so long that they have to turn some away. Well, where have we lost that in Christianity? Why can't we make that challenge to men and, 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 and help them step up to that? You know, just speaking of that, the uh, quarterback for South Carolina, uh, Connor Shaw. Yeah, Connor Shaw. You know, they were talking about what an outstanding, you know, uh, athlete this this young man is, and uh, people are saying that here's a prime candidate for the NFL. Well, he's he wants to be a, a paratrooper, you know, mm-hmm. and so when he gets out of uh, college, he's ready to go join the army, mm-hmm. and so he said all this time in football was training him, preparing him to do something his heart's desire is is to be a paratrooper. Wow, I, I think that's a great uh, yeah. kind of a parallel there, wouldn't you say, Sue? It is. It is. And, uh, and, and if it's not a challenge, it's not really worth being a part of. If it's not, nothing that stretches you, it's really not worth your time. Uh, I, somebody told me a story once that they were in a, uh, in a country where you can't really share your faith that much. It was a Middle Eastern country, and, and they were really making breakthroughs with a group of people. And they were using a word for commitment, and no one, they would get people all the way up to the point to where they would, be ready to receive the gospel, but they would use this word for accepting the gospel and people never would do it and they couldn't understand why they got to that point and they wouldn't do it. Well, this guy was talking to someone else and they finally said, do you mean, this is the concept you're talking about, accepting, receiving, giving your life, selling out, paying the cost? And they said, yeah. They said, then you mean this word. So when they changed the whole word in that concept, then they had many, many people who accepted Jesus Christ. Because that first word didn't have enough challenge to it. It was too weak. It was not a cost involved in it. There was no vestment. There was no life given to it. It wasn't challenged enough. So people were saying, if that's all it is, it's not even worth me submitting or submerging myself into this. When they used this other word that called for life-giving challenge and cost, and they had people just mm-hmm. come to Christ that way. And I'll say, you know, even the idea that he asked me to be at his house at 5 a.m. was a very foreign concept to me. Uh, being there in the dark, talking to him, uh, we continued to meet on Tuesday mornings at 5 a.m. Uh, every Tuesday following. And uh, we uh, we would study the scriptures. We would get life on lifetime uh, throughout the, the, the week and, and months. Um, but I always remember uh, thinking that I was a part of something special, that I had not this opportunity uh, to be with this uh, godly man in the middle of the night. <laughs> That's what it was to me, uh, studying the scriptures. But I knew I was a part of something special. There was some, there was some teeth to this. Uh, we were memorizing the word together. We were studying, uh, understanding the context. We were going out and living it out. And and it, and it wasn't just uh, you know grabbing a breakfast with a guy or reading a book with someone. Like there was there was a lifestyle that I was embracing. That was there was a a, a lifestyle cost kind of a call. And again, what, what impressed upon me was it was what I saw in the New Testament. It just had been foreign to me, even in the Christian culture. In the New Testament, we hear Jesus saying that if you follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. What about that teaching of Christ, soup do we not understand today? What, where are we misdirected or misguided we, when we hear Jesus say that and how we apply it to our life today in the church? Well, if we look at the hit- historical context of it, uh, Jesus, the, the term used of him more than anything was teacher or rabbi. And when they said that, when the rabbi said, follow me, that didn't just mean come and know what I know, come and hang with me, come and get a, a chicken biscuit for 45 minutes at Chick-fil-A with me once a month. It means you follow me so close that your purpose is to be like me. So you follow me to be like me, and that means with me time, and that means tons of time, and being up close and personal and obedience in that. Well, Ken, you, of course, grew up in the church, uh, you know, called to ministry, seminary trained and prepared for seminary and to, to go into the ministry. I remember you telling me one time you never had a class in your entire seminary mm-hmm. that taught you how to be a disciple maker. Yeah, it's true, and it's sad. I, I did have a great experience. It was a, a, a professor, Howard Hendricks at Dallas, and he just on the side, he, he was a disciple maker at heart, and he was always inviting guys uh, into his life, into ministry, into uh, to lunches, to go be together. He would always 
you know, you wanted to learn from him, but he'd spend most of the time asking you questions and probing and really getting you to think about things. Uh, but there was no class that, that said, all right, hey, here's how, you know, the classes are obviously about uh, how to know the Word, how to teach the Word, how to exposit the Word, and these are important things for a pastor. But I think maybe one of the great um, uh, huge uh, black eyes or, 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 gosh, hurdles, roadblocks in the church having a healthy discipleship culture is our pastors are not trained to disciple. Uh, they're trained to do this thing, which we've taken on as 21st century, uh, you know, modern West, you know, uh, Christian pastoring, which is mostly pulpiteering, if I could steal that word. It's, it's most, mostly just do a great job up there educating us. And I think that's an important part of, a, you know, one of the most important part of a pastor's job. But I think equally as important is that he's a picture of Christ, that he's, he's an under-shepherd. He's, he's doing what Christ did, which is uh, feeding the masses, certainly, but it's also leading the masses by investing in a few, multiplying the ministry responsibility. Those are things I didn't pick up in seminary. Uh, um, matter of fact, I've had some great conversations with uh, seminary professors and even the president where I went to seminary since talking about that and, and really seeing some motion and movement now towards having even discipleship groups, it almost sounds funny, where seminary professors are now beginning to carve out time during the week to just be with the students, to to do life with the students, because they're realizing that deficit in the training of these young pastors. And, and we don't do what we're not trained to do, what we've never seen, what we have no model of. And so it's, I think it's vital for young pastors to have some kind of experience like I had with soup that becomes part of my DNA that I won't, uh, Lord willing, be a pastor who's not discipling guys uh, beyond my pulpit ministry. Now, I think that's a great point you make there when he talks about uh, we coming to Christ and knowing our purpose, knowing our mission. And that mm-hmm. in itself can be a motivating factor when we realize you know, what our mission is, what our purpose is as followers of Jesus mm-hmm. Christ. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, you're exactly right, Byron. I don't know anything's more part and parcel. The 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 call is the mission. The invitation, you know, Second Corinthians five, when when uh when when it says that that we're new creations in Christ, it says God was reconciling uh, us to Himself through Christ, and there's not a period there. It then says and. In the very same sense, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. The invitation to salvation by grace through faith in Christ is an invitation to be like him and to follow him. And uh, somehow, I don't know if it's that we think we can outsmart God or get more, uh, you know, uh, salvations uh, if we if we dumb down the call. But I'm, I'm with soup on this one. I think the more that we really give the same call Jesus gave, uh, that it's a, a call to die to yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. Uh, people really know uh, uh, the privilege it is to follow Christ. They really tether their life around uh, what it means to be saved in Christ and now uh, have this new position in Christ, this possession of Christ in you, and the first thing Soup taught me, and this new purpose. It's all one one thing. This isn't, you know, and, and, and I think that we need to uh, be honest with people and, and call people into that from the very beginning. 2006 is when you founded Downline Ministries, a ministry that seeks to encourage uh, restoration of biblical discipleship in and through the local church. And that's, I think, a real key there, too. Uh, your mission is not to compete you know, against the local church, but to come alongside and help, mm-hmm. kind of help the local church to get mm-hmm. back on track, get back on mission mm-hmm. in the areas may, maybe where there's some uh, deficits. Is that right, Soup, mm-hmm. through a ministry like Downline? Yes. Uh, Downline is a great ministry to come alongside the church to uh, help equip <clears throat> and to uh, partner with the church to help equip uh, to give some venues and avenues for uh, those to, uh, to, to hear disciple-making, to learn about it, to, to practice on it, and to take that back into their local church environment and, uh, and be an asset and a, and a blessing to that local church. Did you ever think, Soup, in your wildest imagination, that Ken and Vaughn was radical enough to start a ministry based on discipleship which you spent those morning hours with him? Well, it's, it's pretty amazing. This guy... He, he, he never ceases to amaze me. Uh, I, I'd, I'd be happy just to sit back and let him finish the interview and talk, you know, because I learned so much from him now. He's a very smart guy, uh, very motivated, has great vision, loves people, and he loves the Lord, and he wants to see people grow, and he wants to see uh, the Word of God multiply throughout the globe. But, you know, I was just thinking, guys, what are the possibilities of what God wants to do in the lives of his people when someone will initiate, you know, you were willing to spend time with Ken and Vaughn, Soup. Mm-hmm. If you hadn't have done that, 
there's a possibility there would never be a downline ministry. It wouldn't have having trained over 1,200 lay leaders, uh, Kenan. Uh, you wouldn't have had the over 40 church partnerships that you have in the Memphis area as a ministry that's seven years old, moving into eight years. Is that right? That's right. We're in the eight. You know, year. I mean, it's it's just really uh, that step of faith, believing God for what Soup did to trust God to be with you on that early morning hour on Tuesday. That what's revolutionized your life and it started a spark, which is now the reality of downline today. And not just in the Memphis area churches, this ministry is around the world now. Mm-hmm. Praise God for that. And, and you, you're nailing it. Uh, I think about all the time I say publicly, I'm forever grateful, indebted to Soup uh, just because he was willing to do what you just said. He, he gave his most precious commodity, which is his time. To a young guy that no, he didn't. He didn't. Uh, Soup didn't have any prophetic vision of what was going to happen, and neither did I. Uh, he just was willing to love me, uh, to give me a model of how to follow Christ, what that means in your family, what that means in your life, what that uh, looks like in your neighborhood, and what that looks like in faithfulness and discerning God's will and obedience in the areas of your life and spiritual disciplines and study. Though he just gave me a picture. Um, and, and the Holy Spirit took that and went places neither one of us ever imagined, and it's still a downline, I think, is no doubt a work of God. But you're right, it's through Soup's faithfulness. It's through the faithfulness of the saints that God moves and, and uh, moves to uh, redemptive purposes uh, for his people throughout the globe. And so the, the question that I hope challenges anyone listening today as they're driving down the road is, you know, what might God do if you were faithful to just – I mean, there might, you may have a neighbor – uh, you, there may be a young person in, in the church. Uh, so you may be sitting next to some. You may be sitting next to a twenty-six-year-old guy this uh, this Sunday at church. That's a complete stranger. What if you, uh, during the two minutes where we greet each other, got his name and invite him to to get a coffee that week just to hear his story? I, I don't know, Byron. But if people were as intentional as Soup was and as willing to invest, I think we'd have stories like Downline. Uh, going on in all of our lives for the glory of God. I think that's the very purpose. Well, I guess you guys have heard the story of Dwight L. Moody. I think it was a shoe salesman Mm -hmm. that, you know, touched his life, Mm -hmm. reached out to him. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, why is it, Sue, why is it that we don't engage? Why is it that, you know, we're comfortable in in our churches and just doing our thing, and we don't get it? Why is that? Yeah, well... Uh, once again, I think what we've done is we've scheduled this thing. We've made this thing a schedule. In other words, if it, I never scheduled him in. I'd call him and say, hey, I'm going here, I'm going this. Are you available? Come. Or he'd call me, and we had that mutual relationship. Well, we did life in the flow, and he saw me exactly as who I am and how to flow, how to be with your wife, my lovely brown sugar, Linda. Yeah, <laughs> I saw her at Memphis State, and she, when she sashayed through, I said, man, I'm, I'm saved, but I ain't blind. And I, I put a ring on that one. And we've been married almost 30 years. But he got to see me with my wife and family, and then we, I'd call him up, and we'd go to basketball courts and just uh, how I deal with people, and, and we'd disciple and talk on the way. We'd take long road trips, and it was just life on life. It wasn't, okay, I got to schedule in Kenan for an hour this week, and, man, if I don't get him in. And I begin to think discipling is spiritual parenting. And so how would it be if I took my biological kids and I scheduled time with them? It, you know, I'm going to get time with you, but this is your time with me. It doesn't work that way. So if discipling is spiritual parenting, you do the same. You, just, you, you flow with life with them, and you just, uh, and, and that's the way you do it. So, number one, we don't make enough time for these young guys. Then I want to challenge the young guys, if you see an older gentleman who you want to spend some time with, then pursue them. Uh, a lot, of, a lot of young guys, I think, they set back like their first-round draft picks and they want people to get after them all the time. No, if they know this is what they need and they know they're struggling and stumbling, they need to find an older man mm. and say, hey, uh, can I spend some time with you? Yeah. And I think of it that if, if someone dropped us right now in the middle of a war and none of us were equipped to do this, then here's what I would want. I'd want someone there to walk up to me and say, hey, Soup, you know nothing about this warfare. You don't know anything about what's going on. I volunteer myself to teach you everything I know about warfare. And you know what? I take the worst one over there because if he's talking with me, he knows something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we got to pursue older men. I've spent my life with older men. Uh, Herb Hodges, 
He's discipled me for 24 years, and that's where I caught the vision of disciple making on his couch one morning in 1990. And, uh, and, and saw multiplication and it impassioned my heart and became intrinsic. Mm. And he said, just run with it. And I've been running with it and I get time with him and have spent over 26,000 hours with him just on the flow, on the go. Before him, uh, a gentleman, Ben Young, who was the first African-American Southern Baptist pastor here in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, before him, Coach Kilpatrick who was my baseball coach at the University of Memphis. And here is a coach taking a young athlete who's trying to figure this thing out about living with Christ, being aggressive on the field, uh, trying to grow the frustration of injuries and stuff, but just loving me through it, teaching me. Jason Linder around the campus. <clears throat> yes, right. <laughs> and then his son, uh, who is Dr. Kilpatrick at Mid-America now, who was basically my first disciple who taught me the, the word called Bible in a Nutshell. So... I've had all these people built into my life, and all they did was just gave me time, and I just got with them and was on the flow with them. Mm. Wow. Well, this all brings us to another point. We want to remind our friends that uh, the 2014 Men's Downline Summit, mm -hmm. Come, Follow, Make, Go, January 31st, February 1st at uh, High Point Church is coming up, uh, and it's time to register, Kenan. Yeah, we'd love folks, especially if you're hearing this and and there's just something resonating like, gosh, I have no idea how to do this or I don't maybe I uh, would love to learn more about how to make disciples, how to really invest my life the way these men are talking today about it. What what might God do uh, in and through my life if I just uh, was willing to invest in another and disciple another? And so I need to learn about that. And and so we've got our uh, men's summit coming up January 31, February 1. Our women's is one month later, February 28, March 1. And so uh, for men and women, we hope that you guys will come. Uh, it's at uh, downlinesummit.com. You can check out all the details. It'll be at High Point Church this year. We're really excited to partner with uh, Chris and Andy and the guys at High Point, and it'll be a great venue. They've got a new venue there, and I know you know all about that. And it's going to be a uh, it's gonna be centrally located. There'll be people from all over the city. Uh, for the men's, we've got uh, Bill Hull uh, coming to speak. If you know Bill, he is a... Uh, written more than 20 books on disciple-making. I'd say he's spoken into this for a generation. He's been a pastor for 20 years as well. Uh, he's a man I greatly respect. Uh, Eddie Broussard, who works with Navigators, uh, directs a lot of their international ministry. I know Soup knows Eddie from mm -hmm. back in the day. Is that right? right. Mm -hmm. You guys used to do some ministry together. He's, uh, they love each other. be good re reuniting there. Uh, Soup will be speaking. Uh, one of uh, my professors at Dallas, uh, Dr. Dan Wallace, who is uh, just a New Testament Greek scholar, be talking about how do we uh, defend and, and uh, the inerrancy of God's Word and why is that important in our culture where it's getting uh, really... Um um, uh, folks are trying to take down the truth of God's Word. And, and others like Ronnie Stevens and Chris Conley, some great local men. And then on the women's, uh, Lisa Turkhurst is coming. We're excited to have her. And Donna Gaines and, and Nancy Holcomb, Ariana Rimson, Cricket Keith. There's just some incredible local and national ladies and men that are coming. Uh, practitioners, uh, whether they have a national platform, a local, or a family platform, these are all practitioners of disciple-making to help train us and equip us to make disciples. And I guess this also, Summit, is an introduction to uh -huh. the, the nine-month program program that goes on, and I didn't mention yeah. the Emerging Leaders program mm -hmm. too, Kenan. Mm -hmm. It certainly can be. You know, we run a nine-month downline institute, what that is what that's called. Again, downlineministries.com has the details on that. And that's a, that's a hey, I, you know, I really want to be immersed in God's Word. I really want to understand a vision for biblical disciple-making. And like you just said, nine months, we get over 200 hours. We're training 100, or about almost 200, about 180 students a year, lay leaders across the city in uh, Bible, disciple-making, and biblical manhood and womanhood. Uh, the summit is 24 hours. It's a steroid shot. It's a, uh, what did Jesus mean when he said, go make disciples of all nations? And we hope to inspire and equip. Uh, if that leads someone to the Institute, then sure, praise God. But even in and of itself, I don't ever want to underestimate what God can do in a moment to get a hold of somebody's heart, to give them eyes, spiritual eyes to see uh, and catch a vision for biblical disciple making. In that, in that 24 hours, a life could be turned upside down for Christ. Of course, registration, go to downlinesummit.com. Mm -hmm. DownlineSummit.com. Now, for our Bot Radio Network listeners on AM 640 and FM 100.7, mm -hmm. if you'll use the Bot, B-O-T-T, -T, promo code when you register, you'll get a discount. So please go to the website and register now. The Men's Summit is January 31st through February 1st, mm -hmm. and then the Women's Summit, February 28th through March the 1st. Mm -hmm. And you can go to the website, downlinesummit.com. Use the BOTT, B-O-T-T, promo code for a little bit of a discount for that. 
and uh, get some friends to go with you, and uh, you know, or maybe a mom and a daughter, a father and a son, you know, and come in together. We talk about that uh, one-on-one relationship. You know, no better place, Ken and, and Soup, than in the home with your son or your daughter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I 100% agree, Byron. That uh, you know, the the first. Um, uh, uh, place of disciple making that God gives us in the Bible. The first context for making disciples is the home. We see that from uh, Genesis uh, two forward in uh, in the Old Testament and the New Testament that dads and moms are to to not just um, not just put food on the table and uh, and provide education of or send you know send our kids to school and get them out of the house. The the goal is to spiritually parent, as Soup was talking about. The goal is to to somehow steward the the nurturing of their soul, which we can't do apart from the Holy Spirit. And uh, even Holy Spirit empowered, we're going to screw that one up a lot. But I, I think the the idea of how do we really um, as Paul writes in Ephesians 6, raise our children in the Lord. Yes. Uh, I'm in the middle of parenting four little boys, and every day that's a struggle. I need help with that. I need to be around other guys that are in the battle that I can learn from, certainly with men who have been there before that can teach me. So you're right. We always address discipleship in the home is, is really a key piece of our downline summit. Well, I have a brand-new granddaughter, you know, and I'm mm-hmm. seeing my role as being, you know, a disciple of her, even though mm-hmm. she lives out of town. Which she was with me over the holidays, you mm-hmm. know, and, and she's uh, not even a year old yet, but, you know, just whispering Bible Verses when I'm clo- mm-hmm. you know snuggling mm-hmm. close mm-hmm. to her in her in her mm-hmm. ear and singing little songs with her you know uh, reassuring her how special she is that God made her you know and just mm-hmm. those kind of things so even grandparent soup can have a role right yeah and, and let me stand in the gap also for the hood uh, you know I live in the Hamp uh, <clears throat> on the other side of Highland those Hamptons and uh, and we have a lot of young men there and young ladies who don't have a father in the home and especially those young men so. You, sung, you single young men or, or you fathers who bring your son, hook up with one of these uh, inner city ministries or inner city church or something who may have some young men who in their ministries who don't have someone to bring them to the summit and, and sponsor them there. Bring them. Let them be some with me time with you. And, uh, and you uh, feel that gap, that void. Yes, Soup, I wrote the word surrogate right here, right before you said that. That was my next point, that you could be a surrogate, uh, you know, mm-hmm. spiritual leader to someone. And, and, and those in, in our urban community that have that need, great opportunities right here in Memphis. Mm-hmm. And really, I want to discuss more about the ministry that you're doing, too, through ICON. I know that you're the director of this ministry in the Binghamton area, Soup. Uh, Ken and uh, God has opened up a door for you now to be the lead pastor mm-hmm. at a brand new church uh, work called Harvest mm-hmm. in in our area, and so we want to talk about that too. But we're going to have to kind of wrap up on this edition of our program. So uh, we want to remind our friends now that today is the time to get informed and go to the website downlinesummit.com gives you all the details. Uh, and go there and find out about the 2014 Men's Downline Summit entitled Come, Follow, Make, Go, January 31st through Fe- February 1st. And then the Ladies Summit with uh, Lisa Turkhurst is going to be the main mm-hmm. speaker, followed by some other great women speakers, February 28th through March the 1st. And if you'll go online to downlinesummit.com and use that BOT, B-O-T-T, promo code, we want to give you a little discount for that. But uh, please go online, register now, find out about it. Any other thoughts, Kenan? Yeah, just I always um, uh, get excited this time of year because without fail, this is now our fourth year to do these summits. And uh, I didn't know what to expect going into them, but without fail, I leave at the end of that summit literally watching, uh, you know, uh, over a thousand men, over a thousand women that just um, are, are catching the same vision I caught 12 years ago. And then I think about the last 12 years for me, and, and I get excited about the kingdom potential in our city, just kind of that tidal wave that's building and the generational impact that will have. So I just can't encourage you enough. I, look, I know a busy schedule. My goodness, I know sometimes it's hard to imagine how you could possibly make this work, but I'd encourage you to take 24 hours on this deal. Uh, make a make a $39 investment uh, in uh, the kingdom potential that God may want to build a downline for his name's sake through your life and come, come join us. Soup, any closing thoughts from you encouraging men to come or women to come to this uh, summit? Yes, I would encourage you to come for the fellowship, to, to meet people like-minded, or if, you, if, or if you're still investigating disciple-making, come in here to testimonies and, and come and rub shoulders with people who are out there doing it, whose lives have been impacted by it, 
and uh, you'd be amazed. Okay, I tell you what, guys, we're going to pick it up on our next program, continue the conversation with those from the Downline Ministry talking about the summit coming up again uh, January 31st through February 1st, and that's the men's, and then February 28th through March the 1st for the ladies. We've got more to discuss with our guests, Kenan Vaughn and Soup Campbell. We'll do it next time on this Mid-South Viewpoint program. I'm Byron Tyler. Hey, thanks for stopping by. We'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.